Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems. Uh, you, as usual, my bias point of view, my bias collection of my favorite theorems, right? My favorite theorems of all. Uh, today, a really good one. Um, the reason I like it so much, well, we will see. It has a fairly easy statement. It is absolutely not obvious. So the proof is something you don't write down on the back of an envelope. It's really, really not, really not easy in that sense. So proof is very hard. Um, and it's also very unexpected in my opinion. Um, I mean, it's based on a very bold conjecture of someone. And I, I'm just very surprised that this is true. And in some sense, it's also very surprising that you could prove that such, such, such a statement is true. Well, anyway, we'll see it. Uh, so kind of the subtitle is minors are majors. So it will be about graph minors. So the theorem itself is also called sometimes at least the graph minor theorem. We will see why, but I went with the uh, the name named after so the theorem name uh, named after the two people who made this impressive work, made this impressive proof. Basically, even they um, came up with theory of graph minors in order to prove this theorem. If you if you want, uh, as I said, a very impressive work. A link is in the description. So the Robertson Seymour theorem. Um, yeah, it's about graphs. So let's have a look at a certain type of graphs. So if you study graphs, okay, graphs, a collection of vertices and edges, as you can see here, for example, my, uh, whatever it is, my square graph with, well, two outgoing, I don't know how to call them, whatever, this guy here. Um, so yeah, graphs, very powerful, uh, matrix theories involved, uh, network theories involved. So graph theory, extremely powerful, extremely nice, and should be definitely part of any kind of basic curriculum in mathematics. So it's, it's extremely easy and extremely powerful. And whenever you try to study a theory, you should come up with a good notion of a substructure. Well, well vector space, you would think about a subvector space. A group, you would think about a subgroup. Uh, a category, something more fancy, you would think about a subcategory, something like that. Um, for graphs, the structure you would come up with is a subgraph. That would be just a collection well, I have my collection of ed vertices, my, my uh, red dots here, and edges, my, uh, well, whatever it is, bluish edges, bluish lines. And you can pick a subset of them such that you still get a graph. That's a subgraph. Um, yeah, subgraphs, of course, very important. As I said, in graph theory, well, you should look at substructures, and substructures are subgraphs. Um, a slightly generalization, or actually uh, quite a big generalization, I will comment on that later, is the generalization of a minor. It's a type of a subgraph, or let's say it's, it's a version of a subgraph. And so the, the major is kind of the graph G. That's what I want to see, I think, as a major. And my H, so this will be G in my example, and my H is my minor. So this will be H in the example. And there are two operations to construct the minor. I call them remove and contract. Um, we will see that in action in a second. Uh, but basically for subgraph, you would just pick a certain number of vertices and all edges uh, connecting them. For example, I could just uh, I would pick those two vertices here, then this will be my subgraph. So this would be a subgraph, subgraph, sub G. Um, very good. But a minor is slightly different. It's slightly constructed in a slightly different way. It's this remove and contract operation, remove and contract. So remove is not a very complicated operation. You pick a certain number of edges. So my, my dashed orange one here and end or vertices. So this one here um, and you remove them. So this vertex is gone. And as you can see here, this edge is gone as well. So remove is just a remove operation. Pick a certain number of vertices, pick a certain number of edges, remove them from your graph. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, that's also a reasonable, I kind of reasonable construction for, for uh, subgraphs and um, like, like for subgraphs. And um, the, the, the other operation, it's a bit trickier to motivate, but it turns out to be the right one is a contract operation. So I just showed you the remove and the contract operation works as follows. So I chose a certain edge between two vertices and I kind of co contract the vertex vertices along this edge. So I identify those two vertices. And if they are identified, 
into this vertex, then um, this edge here is now this edge here, right? So you identify vertices, so you contract them into one. And whatever you get out of this procedure is called a minor. So my H here is a minor of G because, uh, well, this is my example, right? I remove contract, remove contract. So really minors are like subgraphs a little bit more general, okay? That kind of a little bit more general uh, philosophy. And the reason why they were important is the celebrated kuratowski wagner theorem, which we will see, well, right now on this slide. Um, strictly speaking, what I'm showing you is Wagner's theorem, not Kuratowski theorem. So Kuratowski theorem is not about minors. Um, it's more like uh, it's it's more like about subgraphs, not quite, but more like about subgraphs. But it's really the dual of Wagner theorem, and they were proven and discovered around the same time. So I usually just contract them into one, and I just call it Kuratowski Wagner theorem. And in particular, because I think the Kuratowski theorem is fairly well known, while the dual, the Wagner theorem, is not as well known as it deserves to be. It's really, really the dual. In, in some sense, if you know one, you know the other. Anyway, so I just call it the Kuratowski Wagner theorem, and I just wanted to warn you that that might not be uh, the standard terminology. Of course, links to everything is down in the description, in particular, um, a little bit about the history of the Kuratowski Wagner theorems, of the two, actually two theorems. Anyway, I'm interested in Wagner's version, and Wagner's version is the one about minors. And it works as follows. So you have a class of graphs, and this class is what you call planar. And this just really means you can draw them in the plane. A graph a priori is an abstract beast, right? It's an abstract thing made of vertices and edges, but they don't live anywhere. So you can ask the question, actually, can I embed them in the plane? Are they plain? And that's kind of the... Um, uh, the terminology here. So can I draw them such that, so here are three vertices. Let me draw a silly example. Uh, this one here, for example, can I draw them such that they actually live in the plane, something like R2, without the edges intersecting? But that's the question. Can I put them in the plane without edges intersecting? And well, that's a certain class of graphs. So here you have two graphs which cannot uh, be embedded in the plane. And that's not an easy statement, right? So you would need to show that you can't. Um, so a priori, those two graphs, which are called K33 and K5. So the complete graph 33, in the sense that you have three vertices on this side and three vertices on this side. And each one on this side is connected to each one of the others. So this is connected to each one of the others and so on. It's complete. It has as many edges as it gets, basically. Um, on the other hand, K5, so just five vertices and everything is connected to everything. So the top one, for example, is connected to all the others, K5. A fun story, it's not quite clear to me why it's called K for complete graph. So the link is in the description. Um, and I, well, there are basically two versions of the story. So either K is for the German complete, which is just the same as complete, just in German or K is for Kuratowski, who knows? Or maybe K is just K. Anyway, so they're usually denoted by K. And uh, well, as I said, um, they, you can do it as follows. You can order them left to right and it would be whatever, a K33, three, three, or you can just have five vertices, but you connect everything to everything, it's complete. Anyway, a priori that's an abstract definition, right? So let's, let's, uh, let's think about this one. Um, K5, I, I say I have five vertices and everything is connected to everything. That's an abstract definition. It doesn't say anything whether you can embed it in a plane or not. So strictly speaking, you actually need to show that those two graphs are not planar. So they can't be embedded in the plane. And that's not completely trivial. It's not so hard, but it's also not completely trivial. And now imagine you have a huge graph with hundreds of thousands of vertices, and you would need to decide whether it can be embedded in the plane or not. Doesn't seem to be a trivial question. And the Kuratowski-Wagner theorem gives you a, a nice answer to this non-trivial question. The Kuratowski-Wagner theorem, or as I said, the Wagner theorem is this one here. A graph is planar, your graph with 1 million vertices, if and only if it does not contain any of those two as a minor. Uh, turns out that checking for minors isn't all that bad. I will come back to that later. Uh, so actually that's a very 
strong theorem. Right? Take your favorite graph of, with 1 million vertices, check for, for those two minors. If they appear, you're dead, you can't embed. If they don't appear, well, then it's up to finding an embedding because you can. That's pretty nice. And this is kind of where the um, graph minor theorem, the big one, the big one I'm going to show you, um, is really a huge generalization of this theorem. So this was known since, uh, well, let's say the 1930s. Um, and it's a very nice theorem, very powerful. And kind of someone, I'm not quite sure who, um, observed that there's those three points. So it's a minor closed family. It's a minor closed family. You have this nice if and only if statement here about minus, a certain number of minus, and the number of minus is finite. So minor closed and if and only if statement involving minus and uh, you have a finite list of obstructions. So the forbidden minors, the forbidden graphs are also called obstructions, right? Things, if you find them, you're dead. Basically, that's what it is. Um, and someone then made the bold conjecture that this is true in general. And it turns out it is true in general, if it's some generality, which I find very, very surprising. Um, so let's have a look at another example. If, so this is a classical example. Let's have a look at another example. So uh, a tree or more generally a forest is a graph um, without cycles. So the difference between tree graphs, so this would be a tree, for example. Uh, this, this is a nice tree. This is a nice tree graph. Uh, let me add another one. Um, and the difference between a tree and a forest is just that, uh, well, this is a tree. And if I would have another not connected component, then I would call it a forest. So every tree is a forest and not every forest is a tree. It's just a, a, every, a forest is just, a forest is just something where every connected component is a tree, right? Kind of makes sense from the terminology. Anyway, so this has exactly the same properties. And uh, this is not so hard to see. The Korotowski-Wagner theorem is not trivial. It has a reasonably easy proof. It's not super hard. In contrast, as I said, to the main theorem for today, which is ridiculously hard to prove. Anyway, so this is not so hard to prove. You, sh you can actually prove it yourself. That's kind of the same idea. So uh, a certain class of graphs, forests, uh, which just means no cycles, is minor closed. There's an if and only if condition. I will zoom into the if and only if condition in a second uh, for, uh, for a graph not to be a forest or uh, to be a forest. Um, and there's a finite list of obstructions, right? It's minor closed, there's an even only if condition, there's a finite list of obstructions. And the finite list of obstructions in this case is really, really tiny, it's just one. It's this funny graph here, a loop graph. And I just illustrate uh, here how to remove and contract this graph um, to a loop. So this graph is not a tree, and yeah, obviously it is, right? Anyway, um, so what I do is I first remove the orange marked vertices, this one here, this one here, and this one here. What is left, remember if I remove vertices, I also remove this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge. So what is left is this triangle thing, and then I contract the corresponding vertices, um, well, two, at once basically, and or in two steps, and I get the loop. So it's the same statement. And yeah, so let's say you would know this theorem and this one is a little bit trivial. So you worked on graph theory for a while. So you would also know this one. And then you'll make the bold conjecture. Yeah, this is true in general. Uh, I mean, come on, uh, it sounds pretty unbelievable to me at least. You have two examples, uh, but that's basically the story. Um, here's the main theorem, it's true in general. So every minor closed family of graphs has a finite set of forbidden minors. And this is, ridiculously powerful. So they are, they are quite a long list, uh, link in the description to a Wikipedia page, lists quite a few uh, minor closed families of graphs. And for all of them, you will get a finite number of obstructions. So I will highlight in, on the next slide actually why this is absolutely non-trivial. Um, but let me just also mention here why this is absolutely non -trivial. This is not quite, well, we'll see. Um, but this theorem was really proven over 500 pages, over 20 years. This is just, this is just really, really strong theorem. It, it, it's ridiculous that actually people could, could have proved it. So it's, it's really, really amazing. Um, 
and kind of an equivalent formulation, which makes this actually useful in practice, is down written down here. Um, it's basically saying that checking uh, minor closeness, uh, or if you have a minor close family, checking for those minors isn't all that bad. So you can check for minors in a very, very uh, well, in a, in a relatively uh, fast fashion. So n cubed, where n is the number of vertices. So you can easily kind of check if you know the finite list. You can kind of easily check whether a graph is in your family or not, right? You could fairly easy check. A, a computer can do that fairly quickly. Mathematica, for example, has extra code linked to the description. So a computer can actually uh, very quickly check whether a graph is planar or not, which is absolutely not obvious at all. And this theorem says that this works for any, uh, for really, really any minor closed family of graphs, absolutely any. And this is just ridiculously amazing. Um, yeah, and that's why I, I like it so much. Uh, so, so forbidden minors, I would call them obstructions, or they're sometimes also called obstructions. So here's an illustration why this is absolutely not trivial. So if you go from being plain to being toroidal, which is the same, but you can embed, um, uh, instead of embedding in the plane of which you can think of the plane, if you want to add an extra point, then you can say you can embed it in the sphere, S2. So that was planar. Um, and toroidal is exactly the same just saying you can embed it into, well, a torus. And being embeddable in a torus, not so hard to check, is also a minor closed uh, family of graphs. So here's an example. This is called the Hewood graph. Link to the Hewood graph is in the description, H. And I mean, now you, well, you can prove that this is non-planar using the kuratowski wagner theorem, just checking for uh, K33 or K5. So this is certainly not planar, but actually it can be embedded on torus. I show you the animation in a second, which I of course stole, link it to the description. Um, but here is kind of the picture. This is how it looks like on the torus. It, this is hexagonal kind of a tilling of the torus. And uh, I think of this square as being the torus in the way that if, if I leave the square to the left, then I enter to the right. And if I uh, leave the square to the top, then I enter to the bottom. So for example, mm, let's say this, this purple here, this purple region, I can leave here and actually the purple region is up here again. And this green region here, I can leave here and the green region is actually up here. So this is really a torus. Uh, and you can actually try to build this yourself from a, from, a, from a square. So just take a piece of paper, which looks like a square, hint, hint. In practice, it's better to have it as a rectangle. I mean, you can, in principle, do it from a square, from a square, but it's better to have a, a, a long rectangle. Anyway, then you, then you fold it around, uh, let's say like this, into a little cylinder, and then you glue the edges of the cylinder, the remaining circles of the cylinder together, and you get a torus. This is how this picture works, and this is really the honest kind of the honest embedding on the torus that you would think uh, how it looks like. So let me actually show you uh, the video. So here's this really nice animation of the Hewood graph on the torus. It, it's exactly the picture I showed you before, but um, yeah, very visually appealing, um, right? So here's the Hewood graph on the torus using those hexagonal tilings. Anyway, uh, link to the animation is in the description. So if you want to stare at it for a little bit longer, because it looks pretty nice. Anyway, the point is being toroidal is, uh, is, is uh, minor closed. So the big theorem, the hammer, the big hammer bash, just tells you that there's a finite number of obstructions, um, finite list of obstructions. But, and that's a point, this is kind of the point. The theorem is not, well, effective in the sense that it tells you what those obstructions are. It's really like a big hammer theorem that you can apply. So there is a finite list of obstructions, but that list can be pretty huge. So in this case, and I just checked a few seconds ago, um, so this is, uh, whatever, August 2021, um, that there are at least 17,535 obstructions. And the point is at least because um, it's unknown, the precise number is unknown. Uh, the link to the page is in the description. So they are asking for people who, to find more obstructions, toroidal obstructions. So if you know any uh, that are not in this list of 17,535, they list them. Um, then let them know. 
And actually, uh, Wikipedia is not quite up to date. So they actually found 12 new obstructions uh, compared to the Wikipedia page that I also just checked a few seconds ago. Anyway, so um, point is the Big Hammer theorem is absolutely non-trivial. It tells you that there is a finite list, but it's not quite clear what the finite list is. You still need to find it. And even if you, you go just one step further from the kuratowski wagner theorem, it's already pretty hard to find those obstructions in practice. You can, of course, ask the same question for, can I embed a graph in a genus two surface or so something like this? Uh, a donut with two holes, a genus three surface, a genus four surface, whatever. You can ask those questions. And again, they are minor closed. So big hammer theorem tells you, yep, we have a finite number of obstructions. But as, I, as far as I understand, there is no really good way of finding them right now. Okay, before I start waffling, or what, actually I already started waffling, um, let me wrap up. So this, this very powerful graph minor theorem is I think extremely surprising. You basically have two examples to play around with, the kuratowski wagner theorem about planar graphs and the obstruction given by, by two graphs, K33 and K5, and the statement about trees with the obstruction just being a loop. And then you just boldly conjecture that this is true in general. And people call that the Wagner conjecture, although as far as I understand, Wagner denied that it was their conjecture. Okay, so I shouldn't call it the Wagner conjecture. Anyway, someone boldly conjectured that this is true in general, and it was then proven in, really, it was a mammoth task. In a brute force, maybe, not brute, maybe I shouldn't call it brute force, but certainly over, over quite a few years in developing a new theory of, uh, sub-theory of graph theory, theory of minors on 500 uh, densely written pages, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, again, the statement itself sounds fairly harmless, and it's still very powerful, for two reasons, uh, it's, it's non-trivial and very powerful. It's non-trivial. Well, maybe my example about the toroidal graphs kind of convinced you that this is really non-trivial. Finding those obstructions is, is, is terrible. It's hard for, for a general family. And there are zillions of those families. And it's very powerful because there are zillions of those families. Yeah, that makes it very powerful. And you have this funny computer way to check uh, whether a graph in your family as soon as you know the number of obstructions, right? As I said, for example, Mathematica can check whether a graph is planar fairly efficiently, right? It's, it's, it's something like O, o uh, n to the n cubed. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.